Moving on to uh, potentially a use of these quantum networks that we heard about from David, uh, Virginia Doria from Institute of Physics from NEAT is going to talk about uh, quantum synchronization in networks. So good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me. It was a very nice uh, stay in Nice and very in, nice in uh, Bristol and very interesting day. So as um, so uh, he told, I'm uh, um, coming from Nice, from the south of France, and I'm going to address uh, the problem of uh, synchronization on uh, uh, practical quantum uh, uh, network. So. Uh, of course, I don't need uh, to specify again what a quantum network is. We had a lot of talk on, uh, on this. Um, and, uh, okay, I'm drawing here a very ambitious quantum network. But the important thing is that uh, uh, we have different uh, building blocks. So uh, we have discussion about uh, quantum communication channel, quantum computers, and uh, quantum uh, memories with, the inherent, with the relative interfaces. And uh, uh, in the literature, we had uh, many nice demonstration of these uh, individual building blocks, and also with the perspective of mixing them together in the pers mm, with the idea of having a real quantum network. So um, uh, in the progress of this uh, quantum network, there is an issue that is uh, mm, a very general one, which is the one of making uh, all these uh, bricks work together. So I mean, uh, if I uh, want to have a, a complex uh, quantum network with many elements, I have to find a way to synchronize them all. So to distribute an optical uh, clock, an optical uh, temporal reference to all the, part, the, the, the pieces of the network. So in order to make you understand uh, um, a bit more in detail uh, um, what is the problem, I will uh, focus just on uh, um, a simple uh, uh, link, so just a teleportation-based link. And uh, I will consider two uh, faraway users, uh, user uh, uh, A, A, Alice, and user D, which is Bob. And imagine that they want to communicate. So how they can, can do this? They connect each other, each to an entangled photon per source. They uh, uh, take one of the photons coming uh, uh, from the source, and they send the other one to a common relay station where there is a, a bell state measurement that is performed. And uh, thanks to a protocol of uh, um, uh, entanglement teleportation, we can have a connection between uh, the f uh, uh, entanglement can be established between the photons coming from Alice or Bob, even if they never directly interacted. So this scheme has been uh, longly studied. We have a very nice demonstration also uh, in the field outside the lab. And uh, uh, the idea is that, uh, mm, thanks to this, it, uh, um, it is, it's a particular interesting scheme for uh, uh, fighting the propagation losses over the network and, uh, uh, at the same time, the detector uh, um, dark count. So what is the problem of synchronization in this scheme? To understand this, I have to look a bit closer uh, to the belt state uh, measure or to the relay station. At the relay station, I have photons coming from uh, far away sources that uh, must at some point interfere on a beam splitter. It's, uh, at some point, you will end up with a, a kind of two-photon interference. Two-photon interference, as you all know, will uh, uh, means that you have a hongo mandel effect. So the, if the photons are perfect and distinguishable, they will, the probability of finding them one <coughs> on uh, the detector, uh, mm, sorry, uh, detecting one on one detector and the other one on the other detector drop to zero. And so I have the, the very standard uh, hongo mandel uh, uh, interference pattern. And the visibility of this uh, figure can give me uh, an, an idea on how indistinguishable my photon is, are. And when I talk about indistinguishable photon, of course I have in mind that photon must be indistinguishable in the polarization, indistinguishable in the frequency, in the spatial mode, but also on the uh, temporal degrees of freedom. This means that the photons must be perfectly synchronized. So at some point, I need a synchronization. And the only tolerance I have is given by the um, coherent time of the photon. This coherent time can be something of the order. In order to keep the rate uh, of the transmission high, you want photon, let's say, short. So this uh, uh, of the order, let's say, of picosecond or even less. And uh, this is true for photon that come from very far away sources, uh, ideally of, uh, with a distance of hundreds of kilometers. So you can understand it's not very, uh, very easy uh, task. Um, so how do you practically do? Well, you have to pay, of course, attention to all the, if you are thinking about fiber uh, links, which is 
what I'm thinking too. You have to, of course, to pay attention to all the optical length drift uh, that occur in, on longer uh, distance uh, connection. You can, of course, increase reasonably the photon coherence time so as to relax the constraint of your synchronization. But you are always uh, subjected to uh, a different problem. In principle, since you have uh, two sources which are independent, you can have a random or mm, a fast jitter on the emission time of the two photons. And this is not uh, easy to be compensated, because if it's really random and it's really fast, you cannot predict how to adjust it. So a ma major problem is the one of uh, uh, ensure an accurate entanglement uh, uh, photon source synchronization. There have been uh, uh, basically two approach with different uh, declination, let's say. And uh, mm, an approach is the impulse regime. So I, mm, okay, let's say we have the two sources. They will be somehow pumped by two pulsed laser. And the idea is that it synchronized the two pulsed laser. Uh, historically, this has been done by means of electronic synchronization or uh, in a way on uh, uh, some kind of feedback uh, system. This means that you need a very good feedback system. Okay, this can be done, but it complexified uh, the setup and also you end up with custom solutions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and more interesting, there is a, a problem in uh, this uh, system that you, have, uh, you always will have at some point an optoelectronic or electro-optical conversion. And this comes at a price. When you want to convert uh, light into electronic signal or vice versa, you will have uh, some additional time in jitter that right now with current technology are of the order of tens of picoseconds. And of course, there is a problem uh, where you go very with very, very uh, far away sources. So you have the problem of the obsolescence uh, of the feedback system, which is still a limitation in terms of achievable distance. Okay, a different approach is the one of using two continuous wave lasers to pump the entangling photon per sources. If you do this, of course, it's not really, it does not make sense synchronizing two continuous wave lasers. But uh, uh, you, if you want to be sure that your photons are synchronous, what you have to trust is the, uh, the detector here that announces you that you have a simultaneous uh, photon. But trusting the detector means taking into account the fact that uh, the detector can have uh, some jitter at the same time jitter. These are uh, mm, improving and improving, but there are there's still detectors with the order of tens of picoseconds of, uh, of temporal uh, uncertainty. And uh, uh, so to comply with this, what you can do is to filter uh, Again, you filter the photon so, uh, so as to make this uh, uh, temporal uncertainty of the detection negligible. But again, if you filter the photon, you end up with the longer coherence time, so you have a, a limitation of your, uh, a fundamental limitation on uh, your rate. So what we want to, uh, what we propose is to have a different approach, which is based on an all optical uh, strategy uh, to synchronize uh, the quantum networks. So in a general way, the idea is to, that the, a plug and play solution can be already available and this is, uh, uh, this is based on off-the-shelf technologies. Which technologies? From one side, of course, we want to exploit that maximum telecom technologies. Uh, this goes from lasers to fiber component. Why? Because uh, with the, this technology is a very mature one and uh, it ensures fast operation, easy light manipulation and distribution and it's of course compatible with the classical uh, fiber infrastructures. And on the other side, we also exploit another mature technology, which is nonlinear optical, uh, that of nonlinear optics. And this is, will be used to have a frequen uh, frequency, local frequency conversion. And uh, since uh, all the, uh, the shaping we will have is uh, all optical, you don't introduce any optoelectronic jitter. It's optical to optical. So let's uh, see more in detail. I have uh, a quantum network. What I, uh, what I do is that I distribute all over the quantum network an optical master clock that works at telecom wavelengths. It means that it's a pulsed ultra fast optical, uh, uh, pulsed ultra fast uh, laser. So it's a telecom wavelength, so it can be distributed uh, as people do in uh, classical uh, telecommunications so in a very easy way. And if required, based on the specific I lost the point. <laughs> it's required. Based on the specific node characteristic, I can shape it by means of amplification. Again, this is standard IBM dope fiber amplifier. And the linear optical stage is adapted to the conversion I want to implement. So this is very simple. So we, of course, we ask ourselves, is it working? So we wanted to test it to 
so to see if it's true. And uh, to test it, I come back to uh, the simplest uh, connection, so the relay-based uh, um, link. And uh, this is pretty much the setup. We have a telecom master laser. I will then uh, in detail give the detail. Uh, sorry, <laughs> they, uh, give the detailed data. And uh, we have two entangled photon pair sources, which uh, in our case are based on spontaneous parametric down conversion, but this is, not, uh, this is not mandatory. You can have different sources. And of course, uh, to test uh, the quality of our uh, synchronization, we use two photon interference uh, that we saw is a good uh, test bed for um, photon indistinguishability. So I show you in detail the setup. Uh, the main, let's say the main element is the master clock laser, of course. This is uh, off the shelf. It's not something that it's uh, custom done. We call somebody who is selling a laser for uh, classical telecom technology and we bought it. And uh, uh, it's a laser, we, in our case, it's laser with 2.5 gigahertz repetition rate, although you know that it can go higher and higher. And uh, mm, the pulses are 2 picosecond at 1540, so it's very well compatible with standard uh, uh, telecommunication uh, components and uh, dispersion, uh, uh, chromatic dispersion compensation modules. And what's important is that uh, the emission time of this pulse has a jitter which is below 50, uh, 50 femtoseconds. So it's very, very small. This means that uh, we have a master clock laser operating at speed. So we have a high precision in the synchronization because these temporal passes uh, have a residual uh, time in jitter. And at the same time, we have a very high repetition rate, which means that uh, all the setup is supposed to go faster. Okay? It's, uh, you, you, multi like you multiplex your operation. Okay, the laser goes to the two sources, and uh, locally, uh, it's uh, amplified. Again, these are standard uh, telecom components. And uh, it's a frequency converter thanks to uh, second harmonic generation stages that changes frequency from 50-40 to 7070, which is what is required to pump our spontaneous, uh, um, parametric, spontaneous parametric down conversion. And uh, these are all optical local oscillation, as I told you. So this preserves the high uh, precision synchronization because it does not introduce any uh, additional jitters and relies on mature of the shelf components. Again, it's something that you can buy, you call, you buy, and you have it, it's not custom. Uh, the sources are uh, uh, very standard, are uh, um, periodically pulled uh, um, lithium niobate wave guides pumped by directly by the frequency doubled master uh, uh, clock lasers, and, uh, uh, so <coughs> which is now at 77 nanometer. And we use this wave guide because uh, uh, the wave guide approach allows us to have a high confinement uh, uh, of the sp spatial mode, so a high efficiency of generation. And uh, also, thanks to periodical poly, we can engineer the nonlinear optical response of the device. And this is what we do. And uh, uh, we uh, have a, a face, quasi a phase matching, allowing us to generate, you see the emission spectra, allowing us to generate photon at frequency de degeneracy around the 1540, so well inside the telecom bandwidth, which is, again, guarantee of, um, uh, it guarantees us the low loss uh, in uh, optical fiber when we want to transmit the entangled photon and telecom component and tomorrow. And uh, uh, these photons are inside the uh, spectrum emission. We filter uh, two uh, particular kind of photon thanks to a cascade of uh, fiber dense demultiplication stage plus uh, a fiber bag grating. These photons are uh, uh, corresponding to two ITU channels, which are the standards of the uh, channel for telecommunication, and which are a 1543 and 1537. And the clearance time of our photon is uh, uh, 17 picoseconds, which is well compatible with fast, uh, with fast operation. And uh, so I come to the uh, interference, and you may have noticed it's not really a bit splitter what we have, because we are uh, implementing a different kind of Gumandel uh, strategy, I will show you. You have the two photons, okay, they are, their polarization is uh, turned and then they pass through a polarizing bit split and the uh, um, ensemble of these two stages allow us to have uh, at this uh, level a state which is in the polar, uh, the, the two photons which are in the polarization state H and V. So I turn to 45 degrees uh, these uh, two photons, then I filter, I will end up with a state uh, like here. <laughs> of this kind, and you see that if the photons are uh, perfectly indistinguishable uh, in all the degrees of freedom, of course, upset the original polarization, these two terms 
will, uh, com will uh, interfere destruct destructively. And so you will have, uh, the, um, if you measure here the coincidence, you will have a deep like behavior. So why do we take this uh, way, the way, way of doing the Ongo Mandel? Because yeah, it has two advantages. First, if I have a, uh, something that is changing on the polarization of one of the photons, it means that there are less photons that passes this filter stage. So any fluctuation on the polarization will end up on a reduction of the, okay, of the number of counts, but it's not spoiling the visibility of the, of the um, interference. And this is what we want because we want to focus only on temporal aspect. And on the other side, you can see that we have only one fiber break grating. And this is very good because it means that if the puzzle passes through the, they are passing through the same uh, optical filter, so they will uh, automatically have uh, the, same, uh, the same frequency. So this is the setup. You see that in the first uh, step, it's perfectly uh, symmetrical. And uh, we test uh, our synchronization by making, uh, uh, okay, uh, by using uh, the external photon, the one that are supposed to go to Alice and Bob, as a heralding uh, in a, uh, uh, okay, to herald the interfering photons. And uh, uh, so we make uh, the interfering among these uh, uh, two perfectly indistinguishable and perfectly synchronized heralded single photon. And so it means that we will have uh, a fourfold coincidence uh, uh, setup. And these are the experimental results. As you can see, the visibility is very good. The shape of the dip is uh, the good one. It means the position is the one we expected by means of a classical interference characterization. It has the full width of maximum, which corresponds to the, to the coherence time of the photon. The visibility, okay, the visibility is good, I thought. I thought. So this was a, a very a nice first result. But of course, in real networks, you don't have symmetrical structure and it's not uh, made on, on very short distances. So we push it uh, uh, a bit forward. And the first thing we did is, that, okay, we have a very comfortable situation in which we are, every, the distances between the, the lasers and the two sources is symmetrical. This is not true, of course. In real life, you can decide to have a very asymmetric configuration. So uh, what we did is to study the possibility of inserting a, a delay on one of the arms. How do we pick up this delay in a, a smart way? If you notice, uh, the entire device can be seen like a huge Hongo Mandel, uh, sorry, uh, Max Zender interferometer, okay, with changes in the frequency, with changes in, uh, in the state, because you have a single photon uh, at some point. But it's a huge uh, Max Zender. So what we did is that this suggests us that it's a good occasion to study the effect of uh, uh, master clock laser coherence. Uh, we want to be independent on this because we want to have a whatever configuration. And uh, this is what we did. So we used the MacZender to study the, the fringes. It's very classical, uh, very standard. So you have a classical interference with fringes uh, going uh, uh, to 100% of visibility if uh, there is no mismatch in the optical path. And uh, as soon as you introduce a mismatch, you will see the visibility dropping. And our laser is not very coherent because it's not uh, a laser and it's not a frequency comb is an optical uh, uh, clock. So it, what is important for this kind of device is that the pulses are delivered with the same shape, always with the, uh, with the very small timing jitter. They don't mind a bit if there are some small fluctuation in the frequency. But of course, you can see it on, uh, on the visibility. And so we made the measurement. We pick up, uh, a, of course, the, the mismatch longer than the laser coherence length. And it was very good. The results already, mm, it's kind of the same result I already showed you. So we still had a very good visibility and the position is good, the COVID at maximum is good, so we were very happy with it. And now it comes to the real test. We have to test it on long distances because this still 400 meters is not that much. So to do this, we uh, tested with um, two uh, spools of uh, 50 kilometers. So we have a difference, uh, sorry, a distance of 100 uh, kilometers among the two uh, sources. And uh, of course, if you do this, this is very interesting from the conceptual point of view, but these are pulses that propagate over long, distance, uh, uh, long distances. It means that they are subjected to uh, chromatic dispersion. But this is something that you can handle because the laser is classical. Uh, there is no quantum information on it. So you can uh, use uh, dispersion compensation uh, modules that come from uh, telecom technology. So this is something that's not very bothering us. But what is bothering us is the fact that uh, when you are uh, in a real world, fiber lengths, as I told you before, 
changes because we were very uh, strongly affected by temporal, even if you put them in boxes and boxes and boxes, we were very strongly affected by temporal, by, sorry, by thermal uh, uh, changes in the optical fiber. And so it means that you have somehow actively stabilized the, the, the length of the fiber. So this is the, what we measure. This is the supposed deposition as a uh, um, function of the time in uh, free running, so we don't have any stabilization system. Okay, there are good news and a bad news. The bad news is, of course, this. <laughs> you have a huge, a huge uh, variation of the deposition. And just to give you an idea, our dip is uh, six millimeter large, uh, full vitas maximum. So we are, um, of course, much uh, beyond this. And uh, uh, the good news is that this variation is low. It's not the, the random fast variation I was talking about, it's something that you can compensate and uh, uh, in a kind of standard way. So you don't have a sudden variation and you have a slow drift. Okay? Even if it's moving all the time, it's not very complicated. So what we did is that uh, uh, we had um, to put on a uh, tracking system and uh, we did it in a very simple way. Different configuration can be done. This was the fastest for us, so this is what we picked up. So just before uh, uh, the local entangled photon sources, uh, and just outside uh, uh, the spool of 50 kilometers, we, uh, pre uh, we took a, a small part of the laser, and if you see, this is uh, another Max Zender interferometer. Okay, we would uh, pick up uh, uh, also at the very end of the setup, but it was simple for us to do like this. But there are no conceptual reasons. And um, we track the position of the interference uh, as a function of uh, um, of the time, and uh, uh, based on the intensity max, uh, um, on the fringes intensity max, we can have a, a correction, so the con strongly related to the drift in one of the lengths, we can have a, a correction uh, um, on the path of one of the two, uh, sorry, on the, on one, on the path on the, okay, <laughs> we introduce a, a delay uh, outside one of the two sources. And, uh, okay, this is how it looks like, so here we scan, gently scan, so I have to have the fringes, and you see the interference fringes, and the maximum of these fringes is giving us the notion of how much we have to correct. It's not the best <laughs> uh, correction system we could have, because it has a sensitivity of uh, just one millimeter, but it's enough, because we could show that, uh, again, we had a dip in this configuration, and as you can see, the visibility is very good. So it's 90%, so we were happy, with that, even with this. So just to conclude, um, what we propose is an original synchronization approach, which is completely based on all optical, uh, um, in a non-optical fashion, and it's completely based on a plug-and-play component, which are already available off the shelves. So it's not something that uh, comes from custom solution, but it's really, you go, you buy it, <laughs> it's, uh, like that. And uh, we test it, uh, we test with, the, with a very single, uh, uh, very simple uh, uh, structure, but a uh, very interesting one, because it's very sensitive to the uh, synchronization uh, issues, which is the one of the um, two photon interference, with the sources paced up to uh, 100 kilometers, and it works, so we were uh, satisfied. And uh, uh, in principle, we believe that this could be a promises uh, synchronization uh, uh, method for uh, uh, fastly <laughs> proceed toward the practical uh, quantum network. It works for the relay, but it can work also for more general uh, quantum networks. So I conclude by uh, showing you a picture of the, um, of the group. This is Sebastian Tanzili, who is the leader of the, of the group. And uh, uh, Bruno Fedrisi made uh, uh, most of the experiment. And then it was helped by uh, Florian Kaiser postdoc and Laurent Labonte Olivier Leibard that are uh, permanent in, uh, in this. And uh, this is me, who thank you for your attention. And, uh, <laughs> thank, you thank you very much. That's really interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience? There's a microphone on the way. So did you do any kind of polarization tracking as well, or only uh, thermal tracking? No, we did only thermal because uh, we see that the, for our case, polarization was not, uh, was not bothering us. We did, okay, uh, it can be 
of course it can be included. In principle, as I told you, it's not the best tracking uh, scheme we could end up. A, fun, a smarter way is to exploit the whole setup and to have the tracking system at the relay station. We avoid doing this just for practical reasons, which were uh, related to so, uh, we should have find a way to uh, well suppress the, the photon coming from the laser and, uh, and the photon coming from the SPDC. So it, probably the best way to do is to have uh, some temporal slot and to pick, to alternate one or the other one. Also because you don't have to, the temporal and polarization are kind of slower. So you can do it, uh, don't have to have uh, one pulse for the photon and one pulse for the track. You can have one pulse for the photon for the sort of tracking, many parts for the photo. But we didn't do it because we want to go fast. <laughs> but there are no limitations in this sense. And uh, you can apply all the polarization tracking techniques that are done in, uh, in, st in other standard situations. Do we have any other questions? I have one about, so you can imagine a quantum network might have many different sources for single photons. So you consider how you might generalize sort of this optical synchronization to account for various different systems? Mm -hmm. uh, in principle, uh, okay, our claim is that provided you had the good nonlinear optical conversion stage, mm -hmm. and you might hope that you have it because you have a plenty of nonlinear optical uh, conversion stage, it, it, it should work. So imagine that you want to have a device which is, a, a, okay, very simple uh, stuff, you have our silicon, so it's already 15, uh, 50, so you mm -hmm. do nothing. You're very happy. You pump and, uh, sure. and that's it. And other situation, you have to convert light uh, from uh, 1550 to another uh, frequency, which is not this double like we did. You can uh, use the linear optical stages like, uh, of course, uh, some frequency generation, uh, different frequency generation. So you, you can play with that. Yeah. It's difficult to have a general answer because it depends on the device. Yep. But our claim is that you can find the, the nonlinear optical technology is very uh, rich and very mature. So in principle, you can find something that it will still be optical optical because you never pass by uh, electronics at some, mm, at some point yep. and it could work. Cool. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we now have a short coffee break. Um, so coffee should be available outside. So let's just thank Virginia again. Thank you.